Hello, folks. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, I'm actually not an Android developer, I have to confess. Um, however, I think that it's important to think about kind of what are we building, regardless of kind of how we build it. For instance, whether you're a Android developer, whether you're a product manager, or whether you're someone like me who works on backend engineering, like I think it's really important to think about how we affect the world with technology. So that's what I want to talk to you about today. So I want to begin by emphasizing that uh, these are not the opinions of my former employer. My former employer very much wants to be clear that that is not, that is not something that they necessarily agree with, which is unfortunate in my opinion. Um, and also, this is work that I did not do alone. Uh, this is work that I did in collaboration with a lot of folks, including Emily Gorsinski, who is a anti-fascist organizer uh, who has fled Charlottesville and is now in Berlin, Germany. So this is kind of a little bit of a dark subject because of the fact that if you don't get product design right, you can end up in some really dark and awful places. So we're going to be talking about some things that are not so wonderful. We're going to be talking about sexual harassment, disability discrimination, and so on and so forth. So first, I want to argue to you that tech has a very serious ethics crisis. There are a lot of ways that we are failing the world as technologists right now. Let's talk about a few ways that we have made the world worse as people who develop technology. Starting with the products that we build. Like, we build products that are not necessarily accessible to all people. We build products, unfortunately, that neglect the needs of people with disabilities. And that means that not everyone can make full benefit of the technologies that we build. So that's unfair. But we can even move further into actively harming people. Right? We talk a lot about machine learning bias about people who are being denied loans or being denied bail because an algorithm decided that. And that algorithm made that decision based off of biased inputs or because of biased assumptions. And that's not okay. But I think there are even clearer cases where we as technologists have done things that are definitely wrong. Let's talk about a few examples. How many of you have heard about Theranos? Raise your hand. How many of you have heard of Theranos, right? Company says, we're going to sell this top innovating product that tests your blood, and by the way, it returns completely inaccurate results, right? People got incorrect medical results. They wound up potentially going to the doctor for conditions they didn't actually have, for unnecessary treatments. Or environmental harm, right? Volkswagen. How many of you remember the Volkswagen emissions crisis? OK, right? Engineers cheats the emission system to pollute all the time unless it's under test conditions, in which case it would pretend to be a, normal, a normally operating system, right? That's not okay, that's hurting the environment. Or what about the case of Cambridge Analytica, right? Of engaging in propaganda and political manipulation, right? That's harming the world, that's harming the foundation of our democracies. But I want to talk about two specific applications that are mobile applications that have significantly hurt people. First of all, I want to talk about the Absure app. How many of you know what that is? OK, fewer of you. So the Absure app is an application developed by the government of Saudi Arabia. And that application is used in order to both uh, track where women in Saudi Arabia go, including preventing them from leaving the country, and also is used by their male guardians in order to grant permission or not for them to leave the country, or to notify the guardian if the woman leaves the country. I don't think that that's a good thing. I think that that's really dangerous, to use technology to facilitate human rights abuses, to use technology to facilitate a system that systematically oppresses women. And I want to talk about another application, the La Liga app. How many of you have heard about the La Liga app? Okay, a couple of you. So La Liga de Fútbol Español is the Spanish National Soccer League, because football, soccer, same thing. Um, so they had this app that they would encourage their fans to install. And it would give you, you know, sports scores, real-time commentary, all well and good things. It also happened to ask for permission to your fine GPS location and to your microphone. 
they didn't say what they were using it for until they were forced to reveal on May 25th last year when GDPR, ha when GDPR came into force that they were using this information. Guess what they were using that information for? If you were sitting in a pub, they were using audio fingerprinting to detect is one of their games being broadcast nearby? And if so, they would ping back your precise GPS location to their servers. And then they would use that in order to determine, does that bar owner have a license or not? They were spying on people's microphones in order to conduct copyright enforcement. They were spying on people's physical locations in order to conduct copyright enforcement. I don't think that's OK. How many of you think that's OK? Right? They're doing this without their user's consent, right? That's, a, that's an Im immense privacy violation. So I think that it's really important for us as people who develop applications that run in people's pockets to think really carefully about what the implications are and how it could be misused. And would you really be happy with what you're doing being printed on the front page of the New York Times? But I think that there's other problems in the tech industry. We also have problems with our working conditions. There is a large problem with disparities in access to pay equality and to opportunity equality. And people are consistently sexually harassed. People are consistently discriminated against on the basis of their gender identity, on the basis of their race, and so many other categories. And this means that not everyone has the same opportunity to be in this room with us developing software. And I think that's really unfortunate. I think that that is an ethical violation because of the fact that it means that some people don't have the same access, that some people don't have the same ability to participate in the system. And we also have to think about the wider ecosystem of what we do. For instance, folks who work on ride-sharing apps or gig economy apps, we have to own the impact of what we do. We have to think about what are the effects upon people's, uh, people's health insurance when people are not necessarily having full-time jobs anymore? What are the impacts of applications like Airbnb in terms of gentrification and raising rents? What is our own impact as software engineers when we move into a neighborhood and, and offer to pay higher rents? And what do our companies lobby for? Are our companies lobbying in our interest or in the public interest, or are they only lobbying for their bottom line in Washington, DC? I think that it's really important for us to think also about the intersections of these things. Because sometimes product ethics, working conditions, and the entire ecosystem all come together into one place. Is it OK, for instance, to ask someone who works on Twitter to have to be subjected to abuse on Twitter? What about people who work on a gaming app, right? Or who work on a massively multiplayer game? The gaming community is so full of toxicity, right? Where fans will go and verbally abuse people who work for game studios. That shouldn't just be business as usual, right? That's not OK for us to have to suffer through this as tech employees. And I think that ethics codes are not enough. That we don't have to treat every single ethics problem like a very kind of nuanced situation that involves trading off harms against multiple groups of people. I think that in reality, a significant problem that we have is that the trade-off is often between people and profit. And I think that we should really always prioritize the people rather than the, than the profit. Here's an example. Immigrations and Customs Enforcement in the United States. So a contractor for ICE developed a sophisticated algorithm that was supposed to determine whether a person in ICE custody was a flight risk or not, and therefore decide whether to release them on parole or whether to keep them detained in an ICE uh, detention center. Guess what? ICE decided they were going to change the entire algorithm and they're just going to overwrite it to make the algorithm always output the output detain, right? This was kind of just making this entire algorithm into hogwash and saying, you know what? It's sophisticated machine learning. By the way, it always outputs detain, right? 
I, I don't think that this is a subtle issue with you know, biased inputs. I think that this is a human deciding and ordering a programmer to change the program in order to make it do something biased. Or let's talk about Facebook. Let's talk about the failure of Facebook until literally the past two weeks to, to kind of, Facebook was trying to say, you know, hey, we think that white nationalism is a separate thing from white supremacy. And it's like, come on, no, you're, 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 picking, you're, you're picking nets here. These two are one and the same thing. And Facebook's failure to address this problem in terms of content moderation has significantly resulted in anti-refugee violence in Germany and a lot of other problems with white nationalism and racism across the globe. So I think that we really have ethical choices to make, and I don't think that they're about trading off harms. I think they're about kind of what are we willing to personally sacrifice? Because our ethics really do matter. It's really not OK for us to design products that are, that are going to mistreat each other's employees. I think it's not OK for us to harm our users. I think it's not OK for us to harm our communities. We have to not have our applications that we develop hurt people. And that means that we have to work together in order to change the system that we work within. Let me ask you some questions. Just for the sake of everyone's privacy, go ahead and close your eyes, please. I, I, don't, I want you to feel comfortable raising your hand. How many of you have ever seen a unfair working condition in your workplace where someone was treated unfairly or harassed? And just keep coming up, don't they? Wow. OK, put your hands down. How many of you have been ever asked to work on something that you felt was dubiously ethical or, or unethical? OK, put your hands down. You can open your eyes now. For reference, that was about a third of people that had seen something that was a workplace condition that was hostile and about a tenth of people who had been asked to work on something unethical. That's a, that's a little bit scary, right? Like, let, let's think about this for, for a second. That means that this is not an isolated problem, right? This is a significant problem affecting a large number of people in this room. So how can we fix this? So I've had a few successes. Um, I've spent about 16 years working in tech now. And I spent 11 years of that at Google, uh, two years as a manager. And parallel with that, I've been doing advocacy at work for ethics and for my fellow coworkers for the past nine years. And I've managed to have a large number of successes, some of which have made the news. But the ones I'm most proud of are the ones that I quietly resolved without making the news. But unfortunately, some things did, in fact, wind up making the news. Um, it's been 20 months since James Damore wrote this memo. And that was a wake-up call for a lot of us. It was a wake-up call that some of our coworkers were, in fact, either sympathetic to or outright recruiting for white nationalist and sexist causes within our workplace, within Google. And in the aftermath of that, when some of us spoke up and criticized this work of white nationalist recruiting material, we were doxxed. And we were harassed. That's an image of eight people that were singled out as, ha ha, look at those funny people who work for Google. Aren't, go, go bug them. They don't deserve to work at Google. And unfortunately, that had a very real impact. About half of us no longer work at Google because we got harassed out of Google. And about a quarter of two out of those eight people no longer work in the tech industry. And they specifically went after me. They specifically sent threats based on my sexual orientation and gender identity. And they were trying to encourage me to commit suicide. And they did the same thing to Emily Gorsinski. Uh, because she was engaging in organizing against fascism. So these threats are an ongoing issue. And it's, it's quite terrifying, honestly.
Why did my clicker stop? Oh, because I was using the laser pointer butter button. Sorry, I think I may have, I hope I didn't hit someone in the face with that. Um, so anyways, um, yeah, so people were issuing violent threats against, against Google employees because some of us dared to stand up against this kind of stuff. So I'm really tired. I can't do this alone. I need everyone's help. Like, I encourage everyone to think about how can they make their workplace better? So fortunately, we as tech employees have a, have a fairly good number of skills that, that help here. For instance, how many of you do sprints when you're, when you're, when you're working on your, on your projects, right? How many of you do retrospectives after your sprints? What went well, what, what went poorly, right? Great skills, right? That helps you understand kind of what went wrong, how can we make it better, and in a way that's not pointing fingers, but instead trying to make ourselves do better. I think that that's a really powerful set, skill set for examining product ethics, as well as how efficiently did we work. And I think that many of us in this room also have product management skills, right? I think that it's equally important when you think about who your intended user is, also think about unintentional uses of your product. We have to design to prevent harm. And that means looking at all of these potential misuses of our products. Think about cases like, what would I do if I got a court order for this user's fine location history? Are you storing user's fine location history? Maybe you shouldn't, unless you actually need it. Or what happens if someone installs this application on their partner's phone and uses it to track what their, the text messages they're sending or their, or their location, right? <laughs> Spyware is a serious issue. Or what happens if someone inside your organization has access to your database? What could they do with it? What's the worst harm that they could do? And how can you remediate that, right? We have to provide barriers against misuse and we have to provide appropriate controls so that people know how we're handling their data and what are we doing with it. And I think that it's really important to look at some of the parallels with organizing work that happens in the anti-fascist organizing space and think about kind of how can you avoid stepping on other people's toes and how can you avoid kind of selling other people out. In particular, think about, really think about how are you going to avoid handing over data on a marginalized worker? Like, imagine that there is someone who's a sex worker who is using your application and the police come to you with a warrant. What are you going to do? Be prepared before the police come to you, seriously. So, that was a lot of stuff that I encourage you to do something about. And you may be a little bit, like, scared about, okay, like, I, I understand this is important, but, like, how, like, how am I going to actually do this? So. Here, here's the thing that you can do. First of all, you can use your company's culture to kind of advocate for change. If your company says, we value feedback, great, give them that feedback, right? If they try to give you a hard time about it, say, look, like, it says right here in the company handbook, like, you know, we encourage employees to give feedback, right? So really kind of put your company's stated ethics to the test. The, comp uh, the industry does have some ethics codes. Um, they're not a panacea, but they are useful if you're trying to point out to your boss why something may be a problem or why you are refusing to do a thing. Um, so both the IEEE and the ACM have ethics codes that specifically say that we have to prioritize the needs of marginalized people, that we have to prioritize the environment, that we can't just pursue profit at all costs. And we also have the defense that engineers, especially if we stand together, are very, very expensive to replace. Our skill set is still relatively rare at the moment. So collective action and solidarity do work. What would happen if your entire privacy team went on strike or walked out the door? I'm guessing you would not be GDPR compliant pretty quickly. So think about what your collective power is in terms of forcing executives and shareholders to, to listen to you as far as ethics are concerned. There's also two legal constructs in the United States that can help workers with collective organizing. The first one is called Protected Concerted Activity. It's part of the National Labor Relations Act. And it says that if you're discussing your working conditions with another coworker, then it means that it's protected, that you cannot be retaliated against or else your employer will be in violation of the law. So it forbids, in theory, people from retaliating against you 
if you're trying to make your workplace better, for instance, by stopping sexual harassment or by stopping pay inequality. And there's also Title VII, which includes managers in the scope of its protection and says that if you're trying to, if you're trying to whistleblow about something that's an unfair workplace, workplace issue related to discrimination, that that's something that your employer cannot retaliate against you for. It's encouraged to force employers to allow whistleblowing, even by managers within their ranks. So let's talk about whistleblowing outside of your company for a second, though. Whistleblowing outside of your company is something that's very, very risky um, because it's not something that is legally protected, except for in very, uh, in, except for in very specific circumstances. So. If you're thinking about whistleblowing, be also prepared to resign, because you very well could lose your job. But also, you have to think about what is the risk that whistleblowing on an issue might stymie internal efforts to make things better in the future. Because once you kind of potentially break trust with your management, they may not be willing to share information about future ethical problems in advance. But a lot of these things, unfortunately, are only retrospective remedies rather than, rather than proactive. The EEOC and the uh, NLRB are not going to come in and, and save your job, right? They'll punish your employer if they, term, if they terminate you in retaliation, but they're not going to prevent you from losing your job right away. So think about how can we support each other, right? How can we both raise the money to support ourselves in case we need to walk away from a job or get terminated, but also how can we collectively work together on this? And how can we potentially document and defend ourselves against having promotions unfairly denied rather than being suddenly fired, right? It's often hard to prove retaliation when it happens. And if you're sitting here and you're a manager or executive, think about, how can I support people in my organization who want to raise issues that are important, whether they be about product ethics or about working conditions? But I think that fighting for change is really worth the cost. But the cost is much lower if we work together. So let's talk about how working together actually works, kind of some of the things I did in my 11 years at Google. So I think the first thing that helps with successful organizing is just getting in on the ground early. If you find out about a potential ethical issue in a product, and you're in a position to influence the design before even a single line of code is written, that's a lot easier to fix that problem than if the code is already written and it's like already halfway out the door to users, right? The earlier you intervene, the more likelihood you have of success. But that means that you have to know what's going on in your organization, that you have to build up a network in order to find out kind of what's going on, what are some potential problems, what are people worried about? And especially, you have to listen to perspectives other than your own. Because you may have a very different perspective than for it, uh, if you as a, uh, as a white Christian person are sitting there thinking about the impacts of your application, you might want to listen to your Muslim coworker down the hall who might have a very different perspective on what impacts your application might have for people. So how can you build those networks? I think that you know, if you work at a small company, you can gather over the water cooler. You can have one-on-ones with people in your company. right? These are standard things that we kind of do to build camaraderie. Well, you know, in addition to talking about, like, you know, hi, how are you? How is your day? How are your children? Also, ask questions about, like, you know, hi, you know, how's your work going? Like, how are you feeling about it? Right? But if you're at a larger company, often that has to take the form of kind of more group communications, things like mailing lists, things like group chats. Actively listen and empathize with people, right? You have to have that trust present in advance before stuff hits the fan. But let's suppose that you do discover that, oh my goodness, there's something really scary and serious going on in my workplace. What should you do about it? Well, find a coworker to talk to and talk to them offline, as close to offline as you can, right? You know, whether it be having an in-person meeting or whether it be kind of meeting outside work in a cafe, you know, in a cafe, or you know, if you're in a remote workplace, like have a video conference. Don't put things in writing. Like that seriously can really harm you in the end, because things that you put in writing have a tendency to stick around. And 
when we're frustrated, we tend to say things that we may not necessarily like to have printed in the New York Times or read in a, de in a deposition. So think really carefully about venting versus problem solving. Because when you talk to that coworker, when you're feeling upset, it may help you to have that coworker kind of listen to you and understand kind of what are you trying to say and help you distill it to something that's a little bit more detached. So once you've identified kind of, okay, there's a problem, I've kind of gotten all my rage and anger out, now what? Well, the most important thing that you can do to changing a decision, whether it be a product decision or a workplace conditions uh, decision, is try to figure out who can affect the change that I need, right? Who is the product manager for this feature? Who's the executive who's sponsoring this launch, right? Like, kind of who's driving this? And try to figure out, you know, what do they want? Who are they? What do they want? And that way, you avoid doing things like shooting the messenger, right? Like, imagine that you're on an application development team and someone is upset about something that you're working on and they come and yell at you, right? That's not a good feeling, especially if you have no power directly to, to fix it, right? It's a lot better to, to you know, try to empathize and, and kind of make sure that they're pointed at the right person instead of feeling like you're being yelled at with no recourse. So once you identify who to talk to, the next step is figuring out kind of what are they trying to do? And is there a better way of helping them accomplish the goal without hurting people or with hurting people less? And that way you can potentially figure out what are the gaps? Like maybe they have different assumptions. Maybe they have different, thing, different pieces of evidence that they're reasoning with. And if you give them more evidence, it'll help them come to a correct decision. Getting to that point of having a dialogue with the decision maker is really one of the most important things that you can do. And often those people will ask you, you know, can you keep this conversation private? And I think it's a good idea to say yes to that. Because building that relationship of trust and having that honest conversation is a really great way of actually getting change done. But sometimes, unfortunately, that doesn't work. Sometimes decision makers have dug their heels in and are set on, for instance, putting profit above people. In that case, there are a few ways to get to the bargaining table. The first way is employee-led petitions. If 5% of your engineering division signs a petition saying that they fundamentally disagree with the decision the company is making, that's something that the company has to take really seriously. And that often can get you to that position of being able to negotiate with management. Sometimes whistleblowing is an appropriate thing to do. In that case, kind of engaging with the media is a way of adding public pressure. The downside of that is that it potentially entrenches your executive team. If your executives and PR have to defend their existing position, they're going to have a lot harder time changing their minds later. And you can also file complaints with regulators in case it's a regulatory issue. Or you can write to the board of directors if you think it's going to hurt the company's bottom line down the road. But at the end of the day, the things that we can fundamentally do with our own labor is choose to take it elsewhere by striking or quitting. But this process all takes time. It can take many months or even many years to enact change sometimes. So you have to think about how do we structure things not just for the two weeks that this feels like, oh my goodness, the world is on fire, like there's a crisis, but also making sure that we have the longevity in order to make our activism movements last longer. So we have to think about how can we spread the work out? Are there other organizers who we can work with in order to kind of sustain the efforts so that we can focus on our day job and also do the activism? So form working groups, right? Like form a group of, you know, maybe six people or 10 people who are working on this so that they don't feel burnt out and also so that executives don't feel like there is a mob of 100 people coming at them all the time. If you do this right, you can get virtuous cycles. Just the same way that we think about continuous integration and continuous deployment, if we continuously integrate feedback on ethics into our design process, we're going to have a lot healthier of a design process. And that means that we can actually defuse ethics crises before they actually become crises, which I think, wow, my equipment hates me today. Um, <laughs> right? If you defuse ethics crises before they become crises, then you're going to have a lot better time and your company is going to function a lot more smoothly. So before I read this quote to you by my friend Emily, I want to tell you a little bit about her background. Um, 
So she's also been in tech about 15 or 16 years. And she works as a data scientist. Um, and she also is someone who is a survivor of the August attacks in Charlottesville in August of 2017. So she's done a lot of really great work, both in terms of ensuring that our tech is ethical, as well as opposing neo-Nazis in real life. And what she says is that crises are a scarcity of time and attention. So guess how you can prevent crises? Give things more time or more attention. And the way that we do that is that we think strategically rather than tactically, right? That instead of fighting each individual ethics fire, we also have to think about systematic frameworks, right? How do we integrate feedback from employees and from potential customers and unintended users earlier before things start actively harming people? Right? What are our scalable solutions in order to buy the time so that we don't spend all of our time being outraged all the time? And similar to the way that you might think about privacy engineering, we can think about how do we guard strength and extinguish, right? How do we systematically integrate privacy and ethics into our design cycles? How do we integrate it into our frameworks in order to make sure that everything starts with safe defaults and starts with being ethical rather than starting from a position of end clarity? There aren't really any Band-Aid solutions. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry there's no, re there's no easy answers. Um, you can't just say, you know, oh, we have an ethical code, or we have an ethics review council, done, check mark checked, right? That doesn't really work. Because ethics can be a complicated subject. Not only that, following the law is the bare minimum. Following the law doesn't guarantee that you're ethical, right? We have to look at the entire picture, and we have to implement systematic safeguards in order to solve these issues. And unfortunately, a lot of the folks who are working on unethical applications are actually outside of this room. A lot of folks working on things that are relating to immigration and customs enforcement, for instance, or the US Department of Defense, work at defense contractors in Washington, DC. They're probably not here. So we have to think about how do we reach out to those people? How do we build an industry-wide set of norms? And how do we proactively address the issues so that we prevent crises and pick the right fights in order to have the best possible social impact? But I'm here to tell you that organizing does work. How much time do I have? OK, I've got 15 minutes. Good. Um, so here are a couple of stories from my time working at Google. Um, this is actually my first time standing up on a stage and telling them in a consistent pattern. So I hope that I tell this in a way that's not going to get me misquoted, um, keeping in mind the front page of the Wall Street, uh, Wall Street Journal or New York Times rule in mind. So how did I get involved as an activist? Um, I first started advocating for users in 2010. How many of you uh, used Google Plus? Wow, that's a lot of you. I guess this is a community of Android people. Of course, you would, you would all have some familiar with Google+. Plus. OK, so Google+, Plus was Google's uh, ill-fated social network attempt. And it was a product that was started in 2009. And it was aiming to try to catch up to Facebook, that they were really afraid of Facebook's concentrated power in the social networking space, and rightfully so. And they decided that they were going to try to figure out what made Facebook successful. And one of those elements that they decided that they were going to use for Google Plus was having a real names policy, saying that the name that you use on Google Plus had to match the name on your ID and your wallet. And unfortunately, I, as a trans person, saw that there were a lot of potential dangers in this. That, for instance, I, as a trans person, had, at one point, a name on my wallet that differed from the name that I used, that I actually used, right? And if someone asked me, can you prove that you're really Liz with your ID? I couldn't, right? But there are a myriad of other people that I knew would potentially be impacted by your real names rule. For instance, I knew that people who are therapists or teachers might not want to use their real names online because their patients might be able to find them, right? That that would be a serious problem or that LGBT teens might want to use a pseudonym for fear that their parents might discover that they were talking to other people about coming out before they came out, right? 
that there are so many different marginalized users who could potentially be hurt by copying Facebook's real names policy. So that was kind of the first time that I really substantively fought in order to achieve a change in a product outcome. We also fought on issues like Google Plus's uh, gender identity selector, where it initially only allowed you the options male or female or other, which was not really well implemented, right? And that was something that we had, both of those issues, we wound up having to fight for about two or three years before we managed to convince the company to turn around this position. And yes, that did involve writing petitions to executives. That involved getting thousands of fellow Google employees at the time to co-sign a letter saying, we don't think this is right. Here's an alternative proposal. And what that petition pressure did ultimately get us was a seat at the bargaining table that we had a group of ombudspeople who were able to talk to the executives and work together over multiple years in order to change the policy. So that's why I tell you that collective organizing can work. I've done it before, and it's been successful. But unfortunately, there also was another issue that was not resolved only via internal activism. And this was an issue involving harassment of Googlers at work. This was an issue that we wound up going to the press in a coordinated manner in January of 2018, so about a year and a couple of months ago. We had to speak to the media to say, look, there are people who are white nationalists, who are sexists, who are trying to recruit other people and to harass people who are gender and, and racial minorities out of tech, out of Google. So we wound up going to the press, and we wound up doing that because Google's management was initially not willing to try to rein in this pattern that was happening on Google's mailing lists, on Google Plus internally. But we did ultimately get the executives to implement a new moderation policy that was aimed to curb trolling and harassment. I want to also talk about kind of the obvious elephant in the, in the room, Maven, Dragonfly, and Google's lack of ethics. Um, Project Maven was a, how many of you have heard, heard of Project Maven? Okay. Project Maven was an effort uh, started by the US Department of Defense to attempt to bring artificial intelligence into its warfare programs in order to use artificial intelligence to automate conducting surveillance of and targeting of people they considered to be of interest for drone strikes. This is, a product, this is a project that they are conducting and testing upon people in the Middle East. And they engaged Google to do some of this work. People at Google found out about this and privately pushed back against those efforts. And when that didn't work, it wound up escalating within the company, and unfortunately, it wound up leaking to the press before the kind of internal pushback cycle was complete. In the end, Google wound up backing down from Maven, in part because of employee pressure, but also because of media pressure. And that meant that Google was not going to be complicit in having its technology used in order to harm civilians in the Middle East. How many of you are familiar with Dragonfly? So Dragonfly was a project, is a project, I should probably say, by Google in order to try to enter the uh, mainland Chinese market by cooperating with the People's uh, Republic of China's censorship and surveillance system. That they are producing a search engine that would be a mobile phone app that would require people to register with their phone numbers, which are tied to their identity cards in, in the PRC in order to be able to perform searches using Google, and that those results would first of all be censored according to the PRC's requirements, but also the search logs of what people searched for would be accessible to regulators in the PRC. So someone could look up who is searching for information about Tiananmen Square, right? Let's think about that for a second. Is that really something that Google should have been complicit in? I think that that's a debate we could have had, Unfortunately, though, Google's executive team hid this. They hid this even from employees working on the project. People didn't know what their work was being used for, and the people that did know 
were threatened with being dismissed, even if they whistle blew about it to other employees. So the person who whistle blew about Dragonfly wound up doing so to a media outlet, to The Intercept, rather than feeling comfortable whistleblowing internally. This reveals that there's a systematic problem with Google's lack of ethics and lack of oversight into what project it was working on and having appropriate feedback both from employees as well as outside stakeholders as to whether the things it was working on were ethical. So I encourage you to think about this, right? In your workplace, if there were a Skunk Works project to kill people in the Middle East or to cooperate with surveillance in China, is that something you'd know about? And if not, how can you fix that? How can you make sure that engineers are appropriately involved in the ethical considerations around their work? The final straw for a lot of us, though, was when it came to light in the end of October of 2018 that Google had paid off executives that they knew had sexually harassed or in some cases actually sexually assaulted employees that they paid those employees to leave and gave them positive recommendations when they left the company. That was the last straw for a lot of us. 20,000 Google employees walked out of the office in the beginning of November of 2018. And that's really a sign that Google's executives were not looking out for the interest of employees. That was kind of the clearest sign to a lot of us. I wound up quitting Google. I left Google at the end of January. And that was because, not because of any one individual one of these, but instead that I could see that there was a pattern, that my former employer was not capable of regulating itself, and that I was going to be constantly pushing uphill all the time, fighting each individual crisis, rather than having systematic solutions for dealing with this. So I joined a company that's much more aligned with my ethics. It's a small startup. It's 30 people. And I had a specific conversation with every company that I interviewed with, including Honeycomb, and I asked, are there conditions that co would cause you to refuse a client? And have you actually refused a client because of your ethics before? And Honeycomb was one of the few companies that answered yes, that they did have an all hands to talk with their employees about a potential customer, and that the employees had collectively decided that they did not feel comfortable working with that customer, right? I think that that says a lot, and I think that that's a goal that we can all aspire to. It may take different forms, but I think that this is a goal that we can aim for in our industry. So in my last couple of minutes, I want to go through some quick resources. First of all, I want to acknowledge that like, while I led some of this work, I also co-led it with many other people. And also, this is a collective effort, right? Tens of thousands of Google employees worked with me on opposing a lot of these things, including, most recently, Google kicked off, uh, or Google disbanded an ethics board that they'd invited a person who opposes my existence as a trans person. That Google employees spoke up and said, we're not okay with this, right? So these efforts are currently ongoing. There are thousands of Google employees who are working in solidarity even to this day. Another, for, another organization that I've been working with over the past year and a half has been coworker.org. They're based uh, in New York, and they're an organization that helps people collectively organize whether or not it takes the form of a union. There's also the Tech Workers Coalition. There is a Tech Workers Coalition chapter here in Boston, as well as in New York, San Francisco, uh, San Diego, and Washington State. And they're really effective at getting workers across different companies to work together and organize together. And finally, I want to give a shout out to journalists. Journalists are really, really important for telling stories and for getting the word out and applying pressure when it seems like internal pressure is not going to do it alone. Talking to journalists is not as scary as you think it is. You just have to come prepared and you have to be aware of what your rights are. So that's all I have for you. Uh, I encourage you to think about all of what I've said and figure out how are you going to rise up in your workplace in order to make sure that you're only working on things that are ethical. Thank you.